Welcome, everybody. I do appreciate you coming here tonight. And I wanted to start by asking you a couple of questions about Jesus' names. What are some of Jesus' names? Anybody? Uh, I heard a couple at the same time. What? Messiah. Some others? Emmanuel. Any others? Joshua is one. That would have been his Hebrew name. So we can see that Jesus has a lot of names, and these are just a few that I came up with. Christ, Emmanuel, Messiah, King of Kings, I Am, the Bread, Joshua, the Life, the Son of God, the Way, the Good Shepherd. I mean, you could do a lesson on each of these and their meaning, but it suffice it to say that Jesus has quite a few names that he's referred to as in the scriptures. Why do you think this is? Why does he have so many different names? Why not just stick with one or two? I think that's certainly one of the reasons that you've got different authors that emphasize different parts of Christ, not to describe him as a different person, but to emphasize certain parts of his character or his personality, and each of these names does that in a different way, so that's certainly one reason. Are there any others? Right, so that's one of the reasons as well. Jesus and Joshua are sort of just names that are assigned at birth like we all have. But a lot of these names have a very specific meaning that conveys some kind of truth about who Christ is. And that sort of plays into the next question, which is why are they so significant? Because each of these names says something different about Christ and about his identity. Because that's what a name is anyway, is it not? It is something that identifies us to the rest of the world. And the reason that Christ has so many different ones is because they identify him in a very specific way. And each of these names has significance in and of itself. Does anybody know what name Jesus used most often to refer uh, to himself as? Son of man. A lot of people don't know that, but Jesus is referred to a lot of different names by a lot of different people. But when you're looking at which name that he referred to himself as most often... It was the Son of Man. This was the title he chose to refer to himself as more than any other in the gospel writings. Which, you think about all the ones that we just listed, Emmanuel, which means the anointed one. We see the analogies that Christ uses to refer to himself as as the bread or the life or the way. Why is it this one that he chooses more often than any other moniker to use to explain to people or identify himself as who he is? What context does this carry? Well, the Son of Man is used 191 times in the Old Testament. So suffice it to say that this is not a term that is unique to the Gospels. This is a term that would have been familiar to those who knew the Old Law, who knew the Old Testament. Those that had read the prophets, they would have known Son of Man. That would have been something that they resonated with and readily recognized. So I think the important thing here is what did they mean when they use it? And this is true when observing any biblical text. When we really want to fully understand what the author is saying, we need to go back and look at, okay, what did they mean at the time to the audience they were writing to? Because that will give us a better insight into the message that they are trying to convey. So in other words, for us to understand what Christ is saying when he says, I am the son of man, we really need to understand what he meant and what his audience meant. Uh, what they would have understood that to mean when he said that. So to do that, we need to really understand some of the uses of it in the Old Testament. And this is a phrase that is used frequently by the psalmists. And David, in particular, is one that likes to use this term. So we'll go ahead and look at Psalm 144, verse 3. O Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him?' 
or the son of man that you think of him. So this is David in a psalm referring to the son of man. Now, it seems here that he's referring to mankind as a whole. That seems to be what he's trying to convey here because he's talking about God and his relationship with mankind and the way that God takes care of us and looks after us and thinks of us as special and important to him. And so when he does that, he says, what is mankind that you have this special focus on us and that you pay attention to us even though we're imperfect and we're nowhere near your level of goodness or holiness and yet you take care of us? He says, what is the son of man that you think of him? So in this context, David is using the word son of man to refer to mankind as a whole, the entire human family as it were. Psalm eighty seventeen. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom you made strong for yourself. So there's a slight tweak in the way that David is using it here. It seems here that he's talking about an individual. So when he says, let your hand be upon the man at your right hand, upon the Son of Man, whom you've made strong for yourself, this seems to be referring to either an individual that God has specifically set apart, maybe David himself, or the people of God. So in other words, he's not referring to the entirety of humanity at this point. He's referring to something a little bit more specific. So what does David mean when he uses these phrases? Well, we can see a little bit of a difference here, which means he's not referring to the whole of humanity in one instance, and he is referring to the whole of humanity in another instance. So it seems as though what this phrase is really trying to get at is that it is just a phrase, it's a sort of poetic way of saying mankind or men individually, but either way, it's like using the word man, just using it in a slightly more poetic sense, which makes sense because of the Psalms are, of course, poetry. There's another instance in Psalms, and, and there's actually several, but we'll look at one here that's kind of unique. In Psalm 8, 4 through 5, What is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. So now this is interesting because David is, again, seeming to, uh, seemingly referring to mankind as a whole. But I want you to notice something interesting here, that he's talking about the son of man, and the way that God has made him slightly lower than the angels, we are, of course, made in the image of God. And so we have a spark of the divine in us, even though we're not on the same level as God. And he talks about us being made a little bit lower than God, or your translation may read a little bit lower than the angels. What David is trying to convey here in either sense is that we're not quite to the level of a spiritual being completely, but we do have elements of God and his goodness dwelling within us. And so, again, he seems to be referring to mankind as a whole in this. And you'll also notice this phrase, little lower than the angels. This is also the way that the Hebrew writer describes Christ in Hebrews 2, 7 through 9. And this is something that's very common in the Old Testament and the New Testament when we compare and contrast the two. That when we're looking at prophecy in the Old Testament, we'll very often see that the prophet is referring to something specific that is happening probably not in the too distant future, but it can also apply to and is referring to something that is a little bit more distant in the future. This is really common with the major prophets, for example. And so I do believe that this psalm is supposed to be conveying God's love for mankind as a whole, but it is also prophetic because he is saying that the Son of Man, if you look at that verse and then think Son of Man is referring to Christ, doesn't everything here fit? That he's been made a little bit lower than God, yet he's been crowned with glory and majesty? That he is going to rule over all things and everything has been put under his feet? Doesn't that sound like Christ? And so we see David not only referring to mankind as a whole sort of in this, this poetic psalm that he's writing, but also he could be referring to Christ in prophecy. And so this is a, a phrase that from Hebrews with a little bit of context and understanding both of those, you can see the parallels that start arising here. This is also a phrase that's very common in Ezekiel. In fact, you'll find it in Ezekiel over and over and over again. 
And we'll look at just a couple of instances of that tonight. Ezekiel 2 verse 1 says, Then he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. In Ezekiel 3 4, Then he said to me, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. Ezekiel 8 5, Then he said to me, Son of man, raise your eyes now toward the north. So what we've seen so far is David referring to son of man as being either someone specific or maybe a group of people that follow God or the entirety of mankind. Here Ezekiel Ezekiel is using it to refer to himself. He's saying that this is the way that God talks to me. When he refers to me, he says, son of man. He doesn't say Ezekiel. He says, son of man, do this. And so this is something that God referred to the prophet Ezekiel as on multiple occasions. And you'll see that all throughout the, the course of the book of Ezekiel. So what does he mean when he uses this phrase? Well, it's obvious he's talking specifically about Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is a man. He is in the lineage of Adam. Therefore, he would be a son of man. And so this is an appropriate title to reference Ezekiel when God is speaking to him. So now that we understand that and we understand the context in which the Hebrews that would have been surrounding Christ, that would have been listening to his words and listening to Jesus call himself the Son of Man, now that we understand that, we understand a little better exactly what they would have thought of and sort of what imagery that would have drummed up in their minds when they heard Jesus refer to himself as that. So that's the reason that Jesus' audience would have understood Son of Man. This would not have been a foreign concept to them when he talked about it. Why was it important to Christ that others knew that he was the Son of Man? Why was it important for other people to know the same thing that they knew when they read it in Ezekiel or in the Psalms, that this was being referred to as someone who is human? Why was that important to Christ? So that's obviously an important part of it that right off the bat, when Christ is essentially giving his introduction to people before he speaks, he is saying, I am a human. So that in and of itself has some scriptural significance. Any other thoughts on that? Right, so he's not only saying I am a human, but he's also saying I am like you. And so he's establishing sort of a groundwork before he starts building this relationship with people when he refers to himself as son of man, not only that, hey, I'm a human being, but he's also saying, I am like you. He's establishing that kinship. It would be like when we refer to each other in the church as brothers or sisters. It's a way for us to let each other know that we're friendly, we're on good terms, and that there is a certain level of community that is expected with that relationship. And Jesus is doing exactly this when he refers to himself as the son of man. Mm -hmm. Right, because of course when he does return in the clouds, you would almost think, well, at that point, he'll be a spirit. He'll be in spiritual form, or you would think so. But he's still referring to himself as a son of man. He's still referring to himself as somebody that has lived as a human. So excellent point on that. So let's go ahead and look at Philippians 2, 5 through 8, because this gives us a little bit of insight, a little bit of insight into why it was important that Christ let other people know that he was a human being. And it reads in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even a death on the cross." Now, look at the way that Paul is describing Christ here. He's saying that he's the form of a man, form of a bondservant. He willingly chose not to make himself 
a, a prince. I mean, God could have done that, couldn't he? He could have come to earth as a king or a conqueror. He could have amassed great wealth. I mean, just not even using his divine powers, his wisdom alone could have allowed him to do that if he wanted to. And yet, he specifically chose to come into this world in physical form as a person that was so poor, he was literally laid in a manger when he was born. Didn't even have a bed or a room for him. And he later refers to himself even as an adult. He says that the Son of Man does not have a place to rest his head. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I don't have anywhere to sleep. And yet, this is the most significant human being that has ever lived in the history of mankind. And so, he had that option. He could have chosen a more impressive stature in life, and yet he chose not to. And I think that it plays into this idea that God wanted to develop a sense of community with the people that he was teaching and also remind them that he was human just like they were. We see it over and over again in the gospel that there are proofs of this. We know he got tired, he got hungry, he got frustrated, he got angry. And these are ways that, that we can see a lot of similarities between the way that we live our life as people that have a spirit but also have a physical body and Christ as well. And of course, we know that ultimately one of the, the points of this passage is that he was obedient even until death. Well, death isn't all that impressive if you don't have a physical body to die. The reason that his death and his sacrifice is meaningful is because he had a life to give. And so let's look uh, a little further down in the scripture. Let's also look at, at something from the Old Testament in Isaiah 53 two, For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and a root out of a parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. All right, so we saw in Philippians, he's not somebody that has a lot of worldly stature, as far as the world would see it. He's not somebody that's rich. He's not somebody that has a fancy title. He's not somebody that went to all the best schools and was regarded as a scholar. And we also see here from Isaiah, he's not an attractive man. He's not somebody that you look in a crowd and say, hey, that's somebody we need to follow. And this kind of goes along, ironically, with his father, David, his forefather, the man that establish the lineage of Christ. Because you'll remember, Saul was somebody who looked like a leader. The Bible describes him as somebody who was handsome and he was head and shoulders above everybody else. He was tall. This was a man that human beings looked at and wanted to follow immediately. David wasn't. He was small and ruddy. This was not somebody that human beings would look at and say, that's someone I want to follow. So much so that Samuel a man of God looks at him and all his brothers and he's literally the last choice, the last one that Samuel wanted to pick because he doesn't look like a leader. Based on this scripture in Isaiah, we can say pretty much the same thing about Christ. There was nothing from a worldly viewpoint that you could look at Jesus and say, that's somebody that should be the savior of the world. And yet he was. And so him referring to himself as the son of man, doesn't seem necessary, does it? Because by every rubric that we can look at from the scripture in his physical description, why would he need to remind people that he was a human being? He looked like a human. He certainly wasn't all that impressive, didn't look superhuman. So why do you think it is that Jesus saw the need to constantly remind people that he was a human being? Well, that's part of it, I think, for sure. He also claimed to be God. In other instances in the scripture, not as often as the Son of Man, he also refers to himself as the Son of God and refers to himself as I am, which would be the way that the Jews understood to be God's name. So yeah, that would be one. Any other thoughts? Okay, another good point. If there is somebody that is doing miracles, doing something that you know is not humanly possible, is not possible from the physical sense, then you must assume that he's superhuman, at least in some kind of way. And to a degree, he was. His physical body was just as human as, as mine or yours. 
but his spirit was certainly different. And so it seems as though there are certain qualities, certain attributes that we can give to Jesus, not physical attributes, but attributes that people would have thought that he wasn't human. And that's the reason that he saw it as important to continuously establish and remind people that he was a human being. Let's look at John 4, verse 19, and this is in the passage of the woman in the well. So when he meets this Samaritan woman at the well, her, the way that she uh, refers to him, she says, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. A little bit later on in that same story, John 4, 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. All right, so first, she can already perceive that he's a prophet. And then she starts bringing up the prophecy of the Messiah out of left field for no apparent reason. Now, I'm not saying that she knew for a fact at this moment that he was the Messiah, because otherwise, why in the next verse would Jesus tell her that he was the Messiah? But I am suggesting that at least the thought had crossed her mind. Because if it didn't, there's seemingly no reason for her to refer to the Messiah at this point. And maybe there was, I don't know, but it seems horribly unlikely to me. And so this woman, who is a Samaritan, presumably not very well educated in the law, not somebody that would have been nearly as knowledgeable as somebody like Saul of Tarsus, has a five-minute conversation with this man and already thinks that he might be the Messiah? It seems to me very clear that somebody that was having a conversation with Jesus could be very quickly convinced that he was something more than human. And this was the reason he needed to constantly remind people that he was indeed a human being. Because basically everything that happened after that humble introduction, everything that happened after saying the son of man, everything that followed that was anything but human. Everything that followed that was clearly superhuman something that was above the wisdom of mankind. And so because of that, he needed to constantly reinforce this idea that I am a human being because his divinity was very clear. I mean, this is someone who figures out who he is in five minutes, despite not knowing very much about the law. Let's also look at John 7, 44 through 46. And of course, what's going on in this passage is that the Pharisees have hired Roman soldiers to go out and take hold on Jesus because they don't like that he's challenging them, he's challenging their power and their hold over the community there. And so in John seven forty four through 46, some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priest and Pharisees, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never a man spoken in the way that this man speaks. These were also people that did not know the law. These were Roman officers. If they knew anything about the law of Moses or the prophecies contained within the prophets, it was very minuscule. And yet, they may not have known that he was the Messiah or that he lined up with all these prophecies, but they knew there was something different about him. They knew that this was somebody that was not the same as all the other people that they had met in their life. The way that they phrase it, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. They have never met anybody in their life that says things the way Jesus of Nazareth does. And because of that, it is very apparent, both through the account of the Roman soldiers here and the woman at the well, that even people that didn't know the law, that weren't well-versed in all of this, It didn't take them long to figure out that there was something more than human about Christ and his personality and his wisdom and the things that he said. And this is why he had to constantly reaffirm that he was indeed a human being. And here's another thing to consider. What happens to Roman soldiers that disobey orders? Does anybody know? Generally speaking, yes. If you are a Roman soldier and you defy orders, you are putting your life into the hands of your commanding officer. They could kill you at that point for disobeying orders, and nobody would ask any questions afterward. That was well within their authority to do so if you disobeyed orders. Yet these Roman soldiers were so convinced that Jesus Christ 
was somebody completely unique and different from every other person that they have ever met. They were willing to risk their lives because they were afraid of laying hold on him. Think about how significant that is. That these people who aren't very well versed in the law, who don't know why this person is so significant, still can sense it, just a gut feeling or something, and are so convinced of it that they are willing to put their life on the line because they are afraid of taking hold of him. This might be why at the trial of Christ, or or directly before the trial of Christ, you see that there is a description in the Bible in the Garden of Gethsemane that they're all kind of hesitant to do anything. There is this hesitancy because in the back of their mind, even if they are enemies of Jesus, they kind of know that this isn't something they should be doing. Their conscience starts, uh, starts giving them a message that this is not something that they should be doing. So, essentially, after this very humble introduction that he is the Son of Man, everything that preceded that, everything that came afterward, was very clearly superhuman, very clearly something that was above the average human. And what's clear here is that anybody that is even willing to consider Jesus' divinity as a remote possibility can see it. Because what we've seen tonight are several examples of people that were not well-versed in the law, and yet here are the Pharisees and the other scribes and scholars of the Jewish law that could have told you everything about what the Messiah is supposed to be. Everything. You can look at the scribes and Pharisees that uh, had talked about Christ can't really be the Messiah because he's from Capernaum and not Nazareth, or that he wasn't born in Bethlehem. They refer to these things not knowing that those things actually were true of Christ, which would entail, which would mean that they should have been able to see the signs. And yet, it is not they that figure out who Jesus is. It's people that don't even know the law. People that don't even know the prophecies, or at least are not very well versed in them. Because they were willing to at least consider, okay, maybe this guy is who he says he is. And they were thoroughly convinced of that in a very short amount of time. And so to anybody that was willing to at least consider, maybe this is the Son of God. Maybe this guy actually is the Messiah. To anybody that at least allowed that possibility in their mind, they were able to figure that out very fast. It was the people that ironically should have known better that rejected him and assumed that he was something other than what he claimed to be. And I also think that there's a significance here too. One of the reasons that he felt the need to constantly tell people that he was human What is one of the earliest heresies in the church? This movement that states that Jesus Christ didn't really come back from the dead. That he just came back in spiritual form. Or another school of thought that he was never really 100% human at all. And the reason, the rationale behind this was because flesh is evil in their mind. And therefore, a holy God could not enter sinful flesh. They were thinking that the flesh itself, Christ taking human form, would have necessarily been evil. And so this is one of the very first heresies that occurs in the church. People trying to convince people that, no, Jesus didn't come here in actual physical form. He wasn't actually a human being. He just came here sort of in spirit form and looked like a human so that he could teach us this. And yet, Jesus constantly reassures people in the Gospels of his humanity. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 14. This is Christ, or sorry, this is Paul referring to Christ and talking to people that were getting caught up in this heresy, caught up in this idea that Christ didn't really rise from the dead, or at least he didn't do so in a physical sense, and his body didn't really come back, or that Christ didn't really come to earth as a human. This is Paul putting those rumors to rest right here and now. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 14. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. That's about as strong a language as you can use. What Paul is trying to communicate to the Christians there at Corinth, because he knows that there are people that are starting to fall into this camp 
that think that Christ wasn't really here and wasn't really human in the truest sense of the word, Paul is saying, look, there are some areas where disagreements may not necessarily be all that big a deal. This is not one of them. If you do not believe that Christ came here in physical form as a human, died on a cross, and three days later, the cells of his body were reanimated, and he came back as a physical, living, breathing human, then everything that we have done up to this point is completely pointless. And you know what? Your faith is also pointless if that reality did not take place. And so this is Paul reaffirming that, yes, Christ indeed was a human being, and that's not just a point of contention or a matter of opinion. That's a fact, and if you don't believe that, then you are wasting your time by being a member of the church. You are wasting your time with your faith, because that is true. And that was important to Paul and to the Christian faith that they knew that. So, why would Jesus need to be a son of man in the first place? Paul obviously believes that this is an important truth to communicate. So, the question is, why was it necessary for Christ to do that? Why was it necessary for him to be here in physical form as opposed to just being sort of, I don't know, some sort of astral projection that kind of looked like it was physically here but not really? Why was that important for Christ to come here in that way? I think a lot of it has to do with God doesn't live like a human. And so to understand what it was like to live as a human, now, of course, God has infinite wisdom and really understood even before this took place. But essentially, when this happened, it alleviated any excuses. Kind of the same thing with Jesus being baptized. The reason for that, you may recall, is to fulfill all righteousness. Christ wasn't being baptized because he needed redemption of sins. Christ was being baptized to say, this is the way. This is the plan. This is the way that God is going to redeem sins. And because of that, I need to make an example out of myself. And that's the way he lived his entire life. By coming to earth in the first place, he was doing that. So that when we look to Christ, we can say, there's somebody that actually lived a human life. Somebody that, like we said before, got frustrated, got tired, got fed up with people, got sleepy, got hungry, got thirsty. I mean, let's be honest, the 40-day fast in the desert is not all that impressive if you don't get hungry. If you're just a spirit that doesn't need food to nourish you anyway, that's not really an impressive feat. And so, for God to experience what it was like to be a human, and for us to understand that, and so that it can convey a level of sympathy and compassion that God has for our plights, That's one of the reasons that it was important that Jesus come here as a human being. God also cannot speak to us in his natural form like a human can. I mean, he speaks to the prophets in the old law, that's certainly true. And we see him convey his messages to the apostles through inspiration. But there is a distinction here. Because you remember when God tried to speak directly to the people on Sinai? That they had to wash and make themselves ready and prepare for the coming of God on Sinai. And when that happened, it was so terrifying that the people were like, you know what, Moses, you talk to God for us. That was their reaction. A lot of us kind of think in our heads, and I think that I've probably been guilty of this too. Boy, it sure would be nice if God would just speak to me directly. After reading that, I was like, you know what? It's better that he communicates to us through the scripture. I'm kind of glad that that's not something I have to go through every time I wanted to know what God wanted of me. And so because of that, so that Christ could live and speak and teach as a human being, that was an advantage to coming here in an actual human form. Furthermore, a sacrifice to save humans requires a sinless human body and a sinless human blood. Both of these things were required to redeem human beings. And because of that, Christ had to take on the form of flesh and blood to be able to offer that sacrifice. He had to experience what it was like to be tempted in a physical human body to be able to offer that sacrifice for us. Let's look at Hebrews 2 verses 9 through 10. But we do not see him, we do not see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. 
For it was fitting for him, for whom all things, and through whom all are things, in, be, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. So there's a couple of phrases that I really want to zone in on here, and I've conveniently highlighted them ahead of time so I wouldn't forget what they were. So one of the things that he refers to is tasting death for everyone. A spirit cannot taste death. God cannot die, at least not in the same way that we can. And so because of that, it was important that Jesus take on the mantle of a human being so that he could taste death and be that sacrifice for us. You see, to defeat death, Christ had to take it head on, and he did. And because of that, he became the author of, their, of our salvation through that suffering. Without that suffering, without having that physical body that could have been tortured on the cross, that could have been broken and drained for us, we would have no hope. And this makes sense to us. Because if you're a firefighter, to rescue people that are in a fire, you have to go into the fire. If you are a lifeguard, you have to go into the water to save people. If you are a doctor, you have to go where the sick people are and risk infection in order to be able to save anyone. And so for Christ to rescue us, he had to take on the form of a human. He had to become a part of humanity and enter into a place where he was tempted and could have at least potentially sinned. He had to risk that in order to save us. And that's why he referred to himself as the Son of Man. Hey, y'all know I'm a stats and numbers guy, so here's some fun facts for you. People that subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel are 200% more satisfied with their online video content and 400% more likely to be able to speak intelligently about politics and religion with somebody they know. Also, four out of five people that subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel live healthier, more fulfilling lives. And that fifth guy was just a social justice warrior with a stick up his butt. Also, 82% of the statistics on the internet, totally made up.